I will be presenting mostly research that probably most of you know because it's very classic research, but it will serve to make a point about research that you don't get to see unless, well, unless you know how to look for it and sometimes unless you know how to research for it. So I also have no money from the industry whatsoever. So I will focus on four things and discuss most of all the last one. So findings that are never reported, the so-called, we call this the file drawer. Sometimes it's a cabinet, so you have an entire wardrobe of research in, well, relate, my field is clinical psychology. There we tend to publish because, you know, they are patients. But in other areas of psychology, it was a norm for a while to only publish the experiments that worked. So when you got the results that you thought you should get, you would publish. So you would do, I don't know, 30 experiments, publish 10. Nobody knows about the others. Uh, I will not talk about psychology, don't worry, but just to give you a gist of this. Findings that are reported, but they are reported selectively, either skipping on some findings, making changes from the protocol, uh, not saying why you made these changes, not even saying you made changes. Findings that are reported correctly, so sticking to the protocol, but uh, with a misleading interpretation. And finally, findings that where the problem is that the research from which they come is so blatantly flawed or lacking credibility that they are even suspicious whether the data is, is real. Okay, selective reporting, this is an absolute classic in the field of mental health. And the first author, Eric Turner, he only had access to this data because he was an FDA reviewer. So those of you who are familiar with the FDA know that the FDA analyzes in-house all the trials for the drugs they approve. So basically the FDA asks for the individual participant data and they have FDA reviewers redo the analysis. So Eric Turner had access <laughs> for this antidepressant trial uh, to both the FDA report, so the complete um, FDA analysis. Sometimes we also have access to this report when the FDA calls the uh, advisory committee. Sometimes they don't, usually they do. Um, and he also had access to the publications. So in this uh, paper that uh, was uh, groundbreaking at, at the time, it was the first, he looked at the difference between what was written, what, what, what had been submitted to the FDA and what had been published after. Same drugs, same trials, all in mental health. And as you see, he showed that for uh, 31%, so 23 trials, uh, were just not published. So the drug was approved and uh, the, the trials so were in the file drawer. The public never learned about them unless, of course, you worked for the FDA or I would say unless there had been an advisory committee and you would go there, look for the report and so on. Uh, more interestingly, 15% uh, had been published with results that conflicted with the FDA decision. So they were published as positive. And he estimated the impact on the literature. So if you looked at the published literature, almost all the trials would be considered positive. If you looked at the FDA analysis, almost half the trials would be considered positive. This, make, this makes sense, right? Because we don't expect all the drugs that arrive at the FDA to work, right? So 50% ballparkish, I would say, is pretty uh, to be expected. If you perform separate meta-analysis uh, of the FDA database, so what was uh, submitted to the FDA and what was published, you would get a difference uh, that range from 11% to 69% and overall 30% effect inflation. So if you looked at the literature, the effect overall was higher as 30%. If you are looking for a specific drug, you might be unlucky and it was inflated more. If you were looking for some uh, drugs, the, uh, the, there was, uh, the, the trials were not published, not great. This is another uh, uh, study in, uh, again, as you can see, the, the, the thread is the same. People who had access to material that does not reach the public, and these are the team uh, 
that consulted in one of the uh, large class action suit against Pfizer and Warner, uh, Parker Davis, and then they uh, had a different name. And this is the gabapentin trial. So basically, for uh, the, the 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 action was for the I think for the off-label indications of gabapentin. But what what is interesting here is that they ex had access to the internal documents. We all have access now to the internal documents because part of the class action lawsuit was that the company was obligated to make these documents public. And in fact, if you are interested now, there is a database that um, collates all these uh, internal documents that have been made public from various lawsuits. And they have for chemicals and they have for food now, I think. And of course, they have for drugs. So these researchers compared what they had from the internal company documents to the published reports. And again, they show they had uh, 20 trials, only 12 were reported in publications. And they showed that find, trials that presented findings that were not significant for, for what the protocol defined as primary outcome were either not reported in full or were reported with a change primary outcome. And in five of eight trials, the primary outcome was changed to statistically favored gabapentin and other such cheery uh, changes. But the, you see the gist. If you had access to the hidden evidence, you get one message and one set of conclusions. If you have just access to the published evidence, you might even reach very diverse conclusion, even opposite conclusions. Of course, the good news is the pharmaceutical industry is no longer doing these things, we hope, or at least not in this way. Again, also here, because we are not reported, six uh, outcomes were not published at all. So either, if they were in the protocols, they were in the company documents, they never made it into the publication. Indeed, the same authors have an, another article that I didn't put here that is an analysis of the communication and marketing strategies that the industry was using in, in a very intentional way to modulate this message. So they are males which are saying, must absolutely not publish this, say this, the publication has to... It's very funny. I looked for for another uh, drug, and they were uh, their discussions of who should we put as the main author of of this paper. Let's invite Dr. Keller. And for us in the public, you know, we think the first author is actually the person who wrote the paper. This is another aspect I won't touch on. But in fact, a lot of these papers were what's called ghost written. Somebody else from the industry had written everything and sent it for approval to the primary author. Uh, uh, now journals are asking you to declare if you've done that. But don't think it's not happening anymore. It's called differently now technical assistance. But sometimes at the end of papers, even in big medical journals, you find that uh, the technical assistance, statistical assistance, and, and so on. Oh, yeah, and 12 outcomes were newly introduced. So they were not in the protocol, but they appeared in the published reports. Finally, another classic, this is a recent example, this is a reanalysis of a trial for uh, SSRI, uh, selective serotonin recaptation inhibitor for uh, major depression in adolescents. If you are following this field at all, you know there is a big controversy, uh, well, not, not so much a controversy anymore, but whether or not SSRIs and antidepressants in general should even be prescribed to adolescents. And the uh, onus here is on the fact that they might be causing harm, and they might be causing harm exactly in the worst way, so by increasing either suicidal risk itself or it would seem some other... Um, like irritability, for instance, that might be related to suicidal risk. So why do I say this? In this reanalysis, so this reanalysis also did not confirm the efficacy, so the drug was not more effective. We've known this. So by now, this was not news because the drug was approved, people used it, and so it didn't really. The, the interesting part here is about the harms. So again, uh, these authors uh, were part of an initiative uh, that unfortunately is no longer funded, uh, restoring invisible and abandoned trials, so they got the funded. Some documents were already available. Uh, Pfizer in a, uh, no, sorry, GSK in um, 
a new move, let's say, towards openness after some negotiations made a lot of documents available. And so, in short, they had access to the clinical study reports. These are patient reports from which they could themselves recode if what happened was related to a harm or not. So you have here, this is the paper. Dr. Keller was invited to write the paper. This is the report from uh, um, Glasgow Smith Klein, and this is the real tree analysis. And it's easier to see in a table. So you see that uh, paroxetine is the SSRI of interest. Dimipramine is an old drug. Nobody was making money from this, so it's not really interested. But you see here, if you take the paper, the, what we read, there were five uh, uh, patients with suicidal and self-injurious behavior. If you have the CSR, so the internal uh, Glasgow Smith report seven, and this is using their own coding. If you have the arbitration, as it's called, uh, from the authors, also taking um, uh, these uh, negative events, if they ha happened on taper, so when you try to stop the antidepressant, they have 11 events. And this might seem like small differences, but in fact, in a randomized trial, since uh, adverse events are so rare, we don't have, so one or two can make a big difference. It, it, it's not so much about the statistical analysis here, but because these are such rare events, it gives you an indication whether, wait a minute, maybe we should first assess where the potential for harm is real. And again, not including the cases on TEPR, any psychiatrist would tell you this is a big problem because it's not like you can keep these people on antidepressants forever. So if when they start taking them out, the risk of suicidality increases. This is also something we must know. But again, if you read the paper, Finally, spin. What happens if you reported it right, you still have one more card to play, and that card is the interpretation. So strategies for whatever reasons that will highlight that the treatment is more beneficial or that uh, even if there is a non-significant result or distract the reader, insist you presented all your outcomes the way they were in the protocol, but then in the abstract, you only talk about one of them and so on. This is the first study on spin. It looked at, um, took a random sample of trials published in one year and looked at uh, those that had negative uh, findings in statistically and looked how many of them did this. So I will just uh, emphasize the spin in the title. So almost 20% <laughs> um, mispresented the findings in the title, the spin in the abstract, 40%. Uh, in the conclusions, almost 60%, and then the spin in the paper, with more than 40% of the reports having this spin, so this mispresentation of the actual findings in more section of the paper. And finally, the last part. So trials that are flawed and maybe even false from the beginning. These are the so-called zombie trials, and this is one of the first articles that introduced this term. So uh, John Carzai, as the editor-in-chief of this journal, he started having a lot of concerns about the papers he was receiving. And he, by 2017, he was so concerned <clears throat> that he was receiving paper based on at least partly false data that he started to ask for the individual participant data. In the beginning, just in suspicious cases, so if there were inconsistencies with the protocol, if it seemed like content was copied, if the means and standard deviations didn't look uh, right. But by 2019, he was asking all trials with the, from the regions with the greatest numbers of submissions. He identified false data in uh, various instances, duplications of figures, tables, duplications of data in the spreadsheets, impossible values, incorrect calculations. And so a zombie trial would be a trial, that's, that's the thing, it's partly, it's not dead, but partly, like, if this trial had been published, then it should have been retracted. We hope it doesn't get published. But of course, you can never know if the data is false. And particularly, you can't know if you don't have access to this data. So here are these two graphs that Nature collated from uh, um, a Carslide paper. You see that 
when he had access to the raw data, then uh, like he identified flawed data in this orange bar, all the orange bar, and part of this flawed data was a zombie. But when he didn't have access to raw data, he could identify very few. And I have on the next slide an example, but I won't insist because I don't have time. But just, just look at, <laughs> at RCT1 reported 32 raids, and all these raids had even num numerators. So strange, right? Or uh, the others are more egregious. One just had copied data from, from another paper. He rejected, of course, all these papers. But the, the, the funny part is, and this again for us from the public, the trials were published later in other journals. And now in this Nature article, Carla is saying that he's writing to all these editors to tell them, look, no, <laughs> retract this paper. But once it's published, no one cares. This is another famous example connected to Carla. This is, for those of you in nutrition, this is the RCT of nutrition, the famous RCT about the Mediterranean diet, uh, PREDIMED. And in the analysis Carla did, the analysis that he used, uh, the data reported in the paper, he took papers in his journals, but also papers in general medical journals, and some were from the New England. So with his analysis that was looking at uh, improbabilities in the baseline table, the so-called table one, right? So looking if the p-value distribution there fit with uh, what you would expect. Of course, it's an imperfect method. But he identified 11 trials from the New England. And to its credit, the New England took this seriously. And so looked at these 11 papers. And for five, they identified a small error. So standard deviations has been presented as standard errors, vice versa. For another five, this is not on the slide, probably the Carline method didn't consider like correlations between variables and so on. And the other one was the PREDIMED study. So it was the, uh, the study of the Mediterranean diet. Then authors were contacted, and they admitted that there were some problems and some protocol deviations. We'll see in a minute which. The paper was retracted uh, and republished, uh, uh, modified. So what were the problems? So people had been suspicious about this paper before, and in this BMJ comment, we have a summary of what, what the audit found. And just look at this. Uh, people had been involved without uh, taking part in the randomization. So household members that had not been randomized were invited to participate. Assignment was based on site, not on randomization. Randomization table had been used inconsistently. And this affected a fifth of the sample. So, so much that you could no longer call this trial randomized now, right? And all it was, it was discovered, it's not like the authors didn't know this. Of course, they knew they did this. But it only came out when the Carlyle analysis identified problems. This is the vaccine, the Sputnik trial. And I unfortunately have to skip because I see I have just one minute. But you see here, there, these researchers identified big inconsistencies. So inconsistency in the number of patients, right? And even here. <laughs> This I like. So the number on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, in, the, in the paper it says this number 35,000 was screened and 21 was uh, randomized. And on clinicaltrials.gov, there's another number in between. But anyway, it's not clear what happened to the 30,000 that were screened but not randomized. So why were they not uh, eligible? Finally, I will skip this part because of lack of time, but I want to show you something else in the end because I think this is uh, nicer. How do all of this impact the published literature? And this is a, a hard, hard effort. So in this paper, this researcher identified the trials for which the FDA inspection had found problems. Sometimes these problems are false information or protocol violations. Sometimes they're very big problems. The case is... And just collating this information was very hard. Freedom of Information Acts were found. He tried to piece together because this information is not public, what they could find on the FDA site and then on Google and various searches. Anyway, in the end, they did find a number of trials where these violations were certain and also identified the subsequent publications. And only three of the 78, 4% of the publications that resulted 
uh, from trials where the FDA had found significant violations mentioned this in the paper. So again, unless you did all this work yourself and sent the FOIA request and checked everything, you wouldn't know. And there was nothing, the FDA, so the focus on this paper is on the FDA that took no action, even if they knew this and never asked for a retraction, never sent a comment, never said, editors, look, we know about this trial and we've identified problems. And finally, a follow-up on this, took one of the most egregious cases, this Aristotle trial where, um, of this uh, drug that cardiologists, I think now, Apixaban, and this had been identified in the previous analysis as the trial with most publications with falsified data, like one of the major offenders, so to speak. They took all the meta-analysis, including the, Ap uh, the Aristotle trial, a publication from the Aristotle trial, and reanalyzed them and showed that in 40%, the results would change. The results of the meta-analysis would change from the initial analysis and the drug would no longer be favored in most of this. So false data, a trial with false data, the meta-analysis building on this, and conclusions that are wrong, or at least wrong with, with what we know so far. And absolutely no way for us in the public unless, I hope I gave you a sense of the work that went in this. The previous paper was published in 2017. He started gathering the documents in 2012. Okay, so a lot of work. And uh, I think, uh, I hope this gives an idea of, of the impact of this research. Thank you.